Welcome, everybody, to another Tower Wealth Advisory podcast. We're here again with Jim Thorne, uh, Chief Market Strategist for Wellington Altus. He's been uh, with us here on Smoke and Bulls and Tower Wealth. Uh, I think this is the third time, Jim. So uh, thank you very much for joining us again. Uh, we're looking forward to speak to you today about uh, your 2023 market overview, kind of what happened in 2022 as well, and how we got to where we are today. So maybe I'll just turn it over to you, Jim, and uh, be interested to hear your comments. Sure. So let's let's break this into like a, th a, a three act play. And so let's first talk about what we were concerned about before we even walked into COVID, right? So we, what we were concerned about was that the global economy had to go through a major structural adjustment, right? The way that it grew after World War II was no longer sustainable. And the forcing function for that was the rise of populism, right? So you had the rise of populism. We had we monetary policy wasn't working. Remember, we were talking about pushing on a string. We couldn't get to 2%. And growth was slow. But in that environment as well, unemployment was actually quite low as well. And what people didn't realize is that we have a structural tight labor force. And this is no different than what it was like in the 1880s, where we moved from agriculture to manufacture. You're moving from an analog to a digital world, right? And so that was, and then COVID hit, right? And we had two shocks. We had COVID and we had war and we had the fiscal policy response to help the world out through that. And from that, we basically got inflation, right? And that was temporary inflation, right? And last year, around December, no, sorry, around May, the Fed and the Bank of Canada started to get really, really aggressive and raise rates which we didn't think was right. Um, they blamed uh, the inflation on the private sector and wages. And remember going back to before COVID, this is exactly what caused the rise of populism, right? Every time inflation reared its ugly head, what did we do? We, we hammered wages in the economy and you know the standard of living for the middle-class workers in North America or the Western world got smoked. And this really started to take hold after the global financial crisis and people got fed up, right? We had Occupy Wall Street, we had demonstrations in Europe. And so we were of the view that it, it look at it wasn't, right? So where, where, where are we right now is, is we're at the point where we've had aggressive rate hikes. The, the, the teeth, so it takes about 12 to 16 months for those rate hikes to be felt. And lo and behold, inflation is dramatically declining. All right. So I just want to put a pin in that. And I want to work back to 2022 in our forecast, right? Our forecast was predicated on the midterm election cycle going back to 1915. And in the midterm election cycle, typically what has happened is that the market has had a 20% correction in the first half of the year, which we did. And then the market typically bottoms either somewhere between June and just before the midterm elections, which is in the first week of October. And that happened. So what's funny is the market really did bottom in June, most of the market, and then it retested the low in late October. What was very interesting, which is exactly what happened in 09 and 03, is the fact that some, some companies or some stocks didn't retest the low. Like, so for example, home building stocks didn't retest the low. Small caps didn't retest the low, others did, right? So what we were suggesting in our 2022 forecast is that we were expecting the Fed to pivot, seeing the data, right? They didn't pivot as early as we thought. So we didn't get the rates of return that we thought we were going to get in 2022 because of that. Um, having said that, if you look at the midterm election cycle um, history, the market typically rallies 50 to 70% off of the midterm election cycle low, depending on whether it's the Dow, the S&P, 
or the NASDAQ 100, with the NASDAQ 100 getting the 70, the S&P getting the 60, and the Dow getting the 50. So we're, we're, and the other thing I would say to you about 2022, just for some interesting things is, you know, you're looking for DNA markings of a bottom. And what we noticed that in October and November of last year, we got two successive months of five plus rate returns, right? So the S&P 500 was up 5% in October, and then the S&P 500 was up 5% in November. That is very rare. The last time it happened was April and May of 2020. The time before that was April and May of 19 of 2009. The time before that was April and May of 2003, which were major, major lows for the stock market. So we have all the DNA markings of a broadening market. The credit markets are now suggesting that the Fed is going to have to cut. The data is just too strong. We are in deflation. And like every of those periods of time, except for 2020, typically what happens at turning points, because what the credit market does is it looks at month over month data, where the Fed is forced for whatever reason to look at year over year data. The credit market is now suggesting that the Fed has to start cutting soon. So pausing and cutting. We also suggest if we will look at the Euro dollar market, which is basically the unregulated US dollar and credit market. So this is a market that's outside of the United States or jurisdiction. Think of offshore banking. Think of the Cayman Islands or the Jersey. That's where all the money is, the serious money. And the thing is, think about this. If I'm Apple computer, and I have a whack of money that I don't want to bring back into the United States, and I want to keep it in cash, so I want to buy a short-term instrument, okay? Um, I can buy an instrument today, or I can buy, let's say I can buy an instrument that will give us me a rate of return uh, out to December 2024. The, the instrument that, gives, that I lock in for to the end of 24 is paying 2% lower than the short-term rates right now which is signaling to the smart money that the Fed over between now and 2024 is going to cut 2%. And so we're going to be in a period of time of slowing growth, right? Deflation, secular stagnation. And really, when you think about it, we're going to go back to where we were just before COVID, right? So I think we're going to be at, you know, 4,800 on the S&P. And then what we do as we have that corrective phase, just like in 09, and just like in 03, and we got to figure out what the heck this thing looks like to the end of the decade. And we're very constructive that it's going to be a secular bull market. So, so that's kind of what we're thinking about for 22 and 23. And uh, so we're very, very constructive and we think people should ignore the noise and realize that you know we're possibly going to be at that point where in two or three years, you're gonna sit there and kick yourself saying, you know, in that period of time when everybody thought the end of the world was coming, we should have bought stocks, right? And you know, the media will sit there and say, it was easy to buy back in you know, early 2023, you could have got this stock for that price. You could have got the bank, of the Royal Bank for that price. You could have got Amazon for that price. You could have got Exxon for that price. So, and having been at this business for as long as I have in this industry, this is, this just feels like that, right? It just feels like you've got to look forward and realize that in the next 16 to 18 months, you're going to be kicking yourself if you didn't take advantage of this opportunity. That's nice. in a bit of a contrast to what you normally hear in the, in the news nowadays is, you know, they expect interest rates to go up uh, over the next couple of cycles and stay up. Uh, for a period of time so you're kind of the opposite of what you often hear yes well look so so what do we have right if we take the last six months of data and so what i'm going to do is i'm going to annualize the, the inflation rate right which is i'm going to take the last six months of data from july i'm going to add it up right and then what i'm going to do is i'm going to times it by two 
because six months goes into 12 months twice, right? Mm -hmm. Inflation in Canada is at 0.2%, right? It's not even at the target. It's not even at the target, right? So, so, and that's with 40% of that variable measuring real estate prices going up substantially and they're actually declining and negative substantially. So if we honestly looked at what's going on, now remember what inflation measures is the year over year change in prices, right? What it's telling you is the year over year change in prices is negative, right? That's not talking about the, is the price level really high, right? Yeah, it's still really high, but inflation is saying, saying you know it's got it's it's the relative price change from one period to the next so if i bought a can of coke if i bought a can of coke at 80 cents a before covid and then i paid a buck during covid and then next year this year in 23 it goes back down to 90 cents right that's deflation right so we're of the view that you know, the Fed's going to have to cut and the Bank of Canada is going to have to cut. And uh, we kind of like the fact that we're out, we're the outlier because, you know, that's why we came and joined Wellington, right? We, well, why did we build this company is to provide that alternative point of view. And all I'm doing is looking at the data, right? I'm looking at the data and say, look at it. If you guys would think that, you know, in the United States, annualized inflation is, is at 0.4%. And 40% of that is owner's equivalent rent that basically said that, that rent and housing prices went up 0.8% in the month of December. There's no data that says that, right? It's lagging, right? So if you plug in Zillow or you plug in, uh, that's the renter data, or you put, plug in Case Schiller, you get deflation. Right. And my whole point is really simple. I'm a kid from Scarborough. Right. Eventually, the data matters and the Fed's going to have to and the Bank of Canada is going to be forced. Right. They're going to be forced. So 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 look at inflation was temporary. It was caused by shocks. It isn't permanent. Right. And if that is the case, what gets me concerned is going think about what happened before COVID with with deflationary concerns. Deflationary concerns were caused by excessive debt to GDP levels, right? It's worse today than it was then, right? Deflationary concerns were caused by the acceleration of moving into a digital world, right? It's worse today than it was back then. Demographics haven't changed. And I'm sorry about globalization, but look at just because we're moving semiconductor manufacturing back to North America because it's a critical component to the supply chain doesn't mean that we're going to be making Nike sneakers in North America. Those people who come out and say globalization is over is are disingenuous. OK, forget it. Come on. Really? Come on. Right. I'm going to buy my Levi jeans from somebody that's, you know, somebody, you know, we're going to it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So, so the structural, the long-term deflationary structural forces are actually stronger today than they were before COVID, right? Remember when we came out of uh, 2008, what did they use to jam down austerity on us? That caused the rise of populism. Debt to GDP. Debt to GDP now in the Western world is 250%. It's higher than it was in 08, where uh, it doesn't work anymore, right? So, so what we do is say, look at, we're just, we're just trying to be honest and be intellectually honest here, right? And so these are the conversations we have with teams like you and your clients. And, and we're, we suggest to you that this time it's not different. The data will win out. And the real concern is if they, if they grasp, so let me just, let, let, let's pull back. What did if 2018 and 2019, what did they want? The Fed, the Bank of Canada, the IMF, and the World Bank. They wanted interest rates above the zero bound to get it off the zero bound. Check. We've got it done. 
And we wanted inflation above 2%. Check. Got it done. Now we're in an environment right now with the kindling put on the fire that if they don't take their foot off the brakes and allow the glide path of the economy by its own admission to get back to 2%, we're in big trouble. Why I'm really concerned about this is think about this, right? Think about we have yet to feel the full effects of all the historic rate hikes and inflation is dramatically falling as it is, right? These people are smart. They know this. They know they, the risk is deflation. They know that they can't, if they don't pull back, that there is going to be, you know, heck to pay because once the momentum goes the other way, they're not going to be able to stop it. So what are we, what are we, what are we thinking, right? What are we thinking? We think that intellectually they know this has to happen. We think that they're, but these, to get to the head of the Bank of Canada and to, to become the head of the, the Bank of, or the, the Federal Reserve, you have to be a political animal as well. So they have to have an off ramp, right? They're going to raise 25 and they shouldn't. And then they're going to pause, right? They're going to pause. And then they're going to cut in the summertime. And you know, the last time they did this, was 1994, 1995. And do you know what happened in 1994, 1995? It was a midterm election cycle year. And do you know what happened in 1994? Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton tried to get through Hillary Care and everybody freaked out. And it wasn't until Bill and Hillary Clinton lost the midterm election to Newt Gingrich and you got gridlock in the United States and they were worried about the debt ceiling. Does that sound familiar? right? The Republicans have just basically taken over. They've got the purse strings. We're hearing about the debt, right? In 1995, the market was up over 30%. So that's my roadmap. We're going to have a, my, and what happened in 1995 also? Soft landing, right? So that's my roadmap. And, and I would suggest that it's non-consensus, but I would suggest to you that really smart people are just looking at the data the same way that I am, right? And the credit markets all over the world are reaffirming what, what I know this, it might sound provocative, but all I'm doing is I'm looking at the Euro dollar market and the credit markets, and I'm saying what, what, what the credit markets are saying, right? This is a conversations we're having with our clients because obviously they're renewing mortgages. Um, they're looking at us and saying, well, boy, should I buy some GICs right now? Cause the rates are so good, you know, but the big thing that comes up is the inversion. Why are, why are one-year rates higher than five-year rates on both mortgages and GICs? And so they, they feel they're getting ripped off. Shouldn't I get a better rate on my five-year GIC? You know, I want to lock into a five-year um, mortgage, but you know now I'm scared. So they're they're confused because this doesn't happen all that often. But really, it's what you're discussing is the is the markets are screaming, rates are going to be lower. And you know, I mean, at the end of the day, has your financial institution ever lost money to you? No. So <laughs> what is the right move here? The right move is to as fast as you possibly can, if you have a fixed income, you know, so what have we been talking about? I mean, you're begging the question to me and it's great. It's <laughs> what have we been saying? You know, you, you know, the volatility in the stock market. Okay. You know, if you don't can, but you look at, let, let's be honest here. If you if you have a portion of your portfolio, that's fixed income, you got to get it there now. And you got to lock in now because you're not going to see these rates for a ever, I, I would suggest ever, you know, I shouldn't say never or ever, right? But you're going, I, I would suggest you were seeing, we have seen the peak in the, in the cycle for rates. And, and, and that's what, look at, that's what the five year, look, look at, look, the two year. And this is, this is the whole, the, what the smart money says in the fixed income. You can fire the Bank of Canada and fire the Fed. All you need to do is figure out what the two year is going to do. The two-year is what the Fed follows. 
The two year in the bank in Canada right now is about 350 and the overnight rate is 425, okay? The credit market's telling you that the Bank of Canada has to cut 75 basis points, right? And ever since, and you know, you go back in history, the, Fed, the Bank of Canada and the Fed have always followed the two-year when the two-year has cut the Fed funds rate over overnight rate from below. It happened, right? It happened. Now, I don't know why no one else is talking about it, but I'm telling you right now, it, 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 if that is the case, then think about it. You know, if they raise again, that means they're going to have to cut rates aggressively in the back half of the year. And so the credit markets are ignoring the Fed right now and the Bank of Canada right now. And so, you know, if we are true long term investors, then and we're investing now for the next 24 to, to 12 to 24 months, then it's peaking the rates are in. Growth is going to slow. We're not going to have a recession because the labor market is structurally tight. Might take some time, right? I mean, we, we need immigration to come in, right, to solve that. And in a slow growth environment, what works, right? It's those structural plays, those secular plays, right? The move from analog to digital. The cutting costs in healthcare. Every company is now a tech company or a digital company cutting things out. So then we go back, you go back to the where it was like before COVID, right? Maybe there's some nuances because we're going to move to net zero. Maybe, maybe you want to have more exposure to oil and gas, which I say yes, right? That's fine, you know. But if you're going to buy an oil and gas play, make darn sure that that, 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 that asset can get to the global markets. I don't think anybody's going to be interested in stranded assets, right? And so, you know, it, it's steady as she goes, right? Maybe if we switch gears a bit, what's your opinion on tech? I mean, it did such wonderful things there through, through COVID when everybody had to stay home. And of course, it felt the brunt of a pullback here in the markets. Is it the one that leads the recovery? Is it slow to recover? I mean, the big guys like Amazon and Microsoft are cutting jobs. What are, where are they headed? The, well, I, I, I would say to you, it's so really, it's, it's, it's you, have, you have to realize that we're still very, very, very early on in this evolution to digitization. And I can remember Larry Ellison of Oracle and uh, uh, a couple of other CEOs of major, major technology companies when I've heard them talk um, in intimate settings, let's say where it's me and 25 other people, right? Those companies are continuing to innovate as we speak, whether the Fed is cutting interest rates or raising interest rates, right? The, the movement of interest rates, whether they're going up or down, it really it changes your and mine uh, 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 view on them, right? So what I'm trying to say to you is, if I took you back to 2002, no one thought that tech was going to basically come out of it and, and Amazon was just going to have a 10-bagger, right? So, you know, I go on record saying you got to buy technology, Right. If you had $100 today and you were thinking out 10 out, out a year, I would take the bet that Amazon will outperform Imperial Oil over the next year, even though I love Imperial Oil or C&Q, right? There's just no way. And, and all these guys say, and they look in the room, and you guys think digitization and evolution doesn't happen, and you guys get head faked every time the Fed starts raising rates, you think that innovation's over. So this is the fourth time I've gone through that, right? Right? I'm not getting traded out of it this time. Right? We're going to we're going we're going to digitization. So pick your favorite ones. It's going to be different, right? We know it's going to be different, right? We don't know who So so I love I have a present I love SpaceX. It's a private company. I think, you know, we're building the new internet, web 3.0, right? It's like 
if we could take get back in in Michael J. Fox's car and we go back to ninety four and ninety five, right? No one knew. We knew the internet was starting up, but we didn't know how it was going to evolve and who the winners were going to be. So what I would say to you is, we're in a new phase. There's no doubt in my sense that we're in a new phase, right? It's 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 Web 3.0. It's AI. It's space. It's 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 you know healthcare, and 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 just keep an open mind, and and it will be revealed to us, you know, where this how this is going to evolve, right? And so, um, yeah, I mean, we're still in the early stages of 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 our globe global economy becoming digitized. And guess what, guys? That's deflationary. Right. That's deflation. When I was in high school. Right. You'd go to the local. I'd, you'd go up to the local McDonald's. There'd be like 50 kids flipping burgers and, you know, working away in a McDonald's. There's like six now. Right. Right. And so we, we somewhat try to make this to, to uh, overthink it. But. You've got that's the trade. That's the future. Right. And once they start cutting rates. All of a sudden, everybody's, oh, okay, okay. And so it's, it's I'm going to give a fancy term. It's, they're called long-duration assets. The purest play of a long-duration assets, as we talked about, is buy bonds, buy the 10-year bond, buy the five-year bond, right? And then when you get into long-duration equity assets, it's those assets that are innovating, right? Right? And so it starts off actually in the currency market. You've seen an extreme correction in the, in the U.S. dollar. Now it's moving into the credit markets and it'll eventually move its way into an equity markets. And this time it's not different. So I like them. Yes. I like tech. That's good. I'd be in agreement with you. Yeah. <laughs> How about uh, you, you just touched on, it. Um, you know, U.S. to Canadian, I guess, or or just even how the American currency is going to perform next year relative to the world. I think we go back, and so I'm using my narrative of 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 uh, we're going to get back to normal, right? So I look at the trade weighted U.S. dollar, right, or what we call the Dixie, the DXY, right, and that traded in a range between ninety five and one hundred, right, and I think thirty percent of that is euro i think you know the canadian dollar is yeah you know, i think six percent or five percent of it so the u.s dollar is going to get back into its historic historic range and it'll be fine right so that's what you're seeing right now you're seeing the trade weighted dollar so i think euro goes to 120 and then i think canadian dollar goes somewhere between 75 and 78 cents right and and it, we're back to normal right and uh everybody's happy and we go from there, right? But but I don't buy into this at the you know that 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 you know the end of the U.S. dollar hegemony and somebody else is going to replace the U.S. dollars of the medium exchange. And I also I don't buy in, I don't buy into you know U.S. has lost its leadership position. Look, and I and and I I do this and I, and I have a just go on if you have Twitter or social media, go on to SpaceX. And watch a tape of them landing rockets on a drone in the middle of the ocean, okay? The Americans own space, okay? Don't, come on, right? There's a problem in Iran. They launch a rocket. They put out satellites. I mean, and then you got the guy from North Korea putting out a wrist rocket over to the Sea of Japan. Really? Really? Nobody can do that technology. The Americans are so far ahead, it ain't funny. Never underestimate the Americans or the American consumers. And so, yeah, do you have a period of time? Yeah. So, you know, the U.S. dollar had a parabolic move last year. Why? Because it was a safe haven trade. It's coming off. So what does that mean? That means that the emerging markets are getting a bit, right? I mean, Greece or the GREK ETF for Greece is back up to where it was in, before COVID, right? Do you think it's because? Greece is fundamentally better off than the United States. No, it's a currency trade, right? So I'm, I'm, uh, I still, I've seen this too many times, right? And so innovation, dollar gets down into the range, 
everybody's happy. Canadian dollar gets to like 70, I would say 75 to 80 cents is going to be the range. And that's where it was before. I think oil, you know, everybody makes a lot of money at $85, right? I mean, that gas is actually getting smoked right now, right? I mean, I would be, I would be buying, you know, you would be until, so here's the thing on energy, right? Um, and it's a cycle. This time it's not different. To get to net zero, one of the things, one of the things that, that the, the knock-on effects of the, the war in Europe is the fact that Europe now is dependent on the United States and other geographic areas other than Russia for their energy needs. That is a huge win for North America, right? That is a huge win for LNG. That is a huge win for oil. Typically, the cycle ends when the weight of energy in the S&P 500 gets north of 15% or greater than 15%. It's at five, okay? So between now and 2030, the weight of the energy in the S&P 500 is going to go up to 15%, right? It's at five now. You guys can figure out how you want to play it. Right. But I wanted if you're going to buy it, I would buy I would buy just make darn sure you can get the product to Europe or Asia. Right. I wouldn't be playing juniors that have stranded assets. I would be buying the big ones. That's what a high quality Exxon, Imperial Oil, C&Q, Tourmaline, whatever the ones you are. But all you the question is, do they have it? Do they have cash? You know, what are they going to do with their cash flow? They're going to buy down, pay down debt buy a dividend, buy back stock, right? Huge free cash flow generations. Are they volatile? Darn to, darn to, right? Before crypto came along, that was the most volatile space, right? I can tell you, you wanna know how volatile it is? When I talk to teams in Eastern Canada, <laughs> they have sworn off energy from the last cycle. Totally <laughs> sworn off. I am never going back, I don't care. So. All I need you to know is that the Easterners aren't buying into it. That's, you know what you do? You got to buy with both hands, right? When those boys are going long and strong, you know, it's time to sell, right? I was going to say, when they're in, we're out. <laughs> <laughs> we just got to get them in first. <laughs> we got to get them in first, right? Oh, it'll happen. They'll catch the fever. Don't worry about that. It's a cycle. Yeah. Happens the same way every time. While we were looking at uh, some graphs the other day with a, uh, a firm and basically they're showing you know your top 25 canadian producers and by q3 of this year every single one of them were in the green in the sense that they have no debt all 25 of them will be debt free by q3 like that's pretty amazing it's and it's they're not gonna they're not gonna invest in anything they're just gonna be pouring it out or or stock buyback so what I say to people, I was just before I got on the call, I was we were I was talking to a, a really good team, really smart team in, in Saskatchewan. We were talking about, I just say, you want my opinion? Depending on your risk profile, you should, and and I'm I'm sorry, and I and I mean I don't mean this in a bad way, right? Um, but I'm anchoring off of the US because the US will tell us when the cycle's over, right? When the S P 500 has a 5%, 15% weight in energy, it's over, right? How do you want to play that? Right. If you and I were working, if you guys and we were working in in Can in New York, 450 Park Avenue, Goldman just came in and just babe pitched us the brick trade, right? You know, China's gonna urbanize, right? There's gonna be, you know, you know, stainless steel. Uh, you know, they're we're gonna get they're gonna get energy and they're gonna have like electricity and yada yada yada. Right. You would basically I remember sitting there at the table at the boardroom on 450 Park Avenue on the 22nd floor. And I go, boys, it's going to 15 percent. It was at 3 percent. We should just buy 15 percent and ride it out in clip coupons. Right. I couldn't get them to do it. Right. But that was the trade. So given your risk profile, given your risk profile and your client's risk profile, I'll give you the end point. Right. My suggestion would be until the the, the, the energy space gets 12 to 13% of the S&P 500, you buy the dips. And once it gets over 12 to 13%, you sell the rallies. 
You can figure out how much money you want and how much what your exposure is. That's up to you guys. I like that. Mm -hmm. How about uh, when we talked to you last year, uh, you were kind of bearish on China. Uh, you still in the same boat? Are they going to bounce here and then uh, time to unload or is it still a long play? I think there is a global concerted effort right now to make sure that the global economy grows. And China is in there with the, the Americans, the Canadians, the Europeans, right? So I look at China and the West as kind of like two divorced parents that are working together for the sake of the kids. Okay, so I would suggest to you for this next period of time, this next episode, right? Um, China and Japan, and we're all going to work together to make sure that we don't crash and we don't have a financial crisis. Because unbeknownst to everybody, and they don't talk about it publicly, they all know that everybody's long debt. And if they screw this up, it's going to be nasty, right? So what we have been chatting about earlier, late this late in 22 and early this year, is I think you should think about what getting in exposure into China or, and in the emerging markets because of the US dollar going down. But let me just be blunt and clear. China is going to go completely differently this time, right? So if you think we're going to go back to where it was two decades ago, like I told you, um, you know, uh, back at Park Avenue, and they're going to build bridges to nowhere, and they're going to be a property development boom, you know, and they're going to, it's going to be export led investment growth, right? That, that is not going to happen. That is typically the growth phase from a, a very, very impoverished country to what we call the middle income. They have to grow differently. So I would focus on companies that are technologically focused, and I would focus on companies that are focused on the Chinese consumer. But I think for this period of time, the China and everybody is going to work together to generate economic growth and to do the best that they can, even though we've got these deep seated concerns about, you know, uh, stealing of intellectual property and so on and so forth. Right. So 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 the view I have is work together. Right. And so what you do when you build your portfolio. Right is I call the term is there's risk buckets. Like, what are you going to, what are you in a, a risk budget, right? What are you willing to put, spend money on in the most risky areas and how much money do you want to put in or allocate, right? So I think China is going to be no different than, than, than disruptive technology, right? I think what you're going to get guys between now and the end of this phase is that every, the rising tide is going to lift all boats. Right. So everything in this fate is going to get back to where it was before COVID. Right. If it's you and I and we are just traders, hardcore traders, I would say just buy charts because it's not going to be based on fundamentals. So the XLE, which is the energy, they're already at 52 week highs like Exxon's there. Right. Amazon is at levels that we saw in 2020. Right. They're both wonderful companies. Right. I love ExxonMobil going forward. I think the management team gets it. Right. I understand what they're doing. I don't sleep at night. But if you are sitting here and we're playing relative basis, then what I would say is I think, yeah, China is going to run hard here. It's already run hard. Right. Emerging markets is going to do great. Right. Small cap U.S. is going to do great. Greece just flew back to the back to where it was. Did you, did you get my dream? Like that's the mindset you have to, to get at. It's a rising tide lifts all boats. And that's normal. That's 03, right? That's 09, right? That's what happened in 20. That's what happens when you come out of a bear market low, right? That's what happens. So, and then when we get back to let's say 24, so what, what, what are we looking at? The hard part is going to be when you when we're talking in the fall of this year, right? When everybody realizes that the Fed and Bank of Canada are raising are cutting rates, which means that the multiple of the S and P five hundred goes from eighteen times to twenty one to two or twenty two times, right? And all the strategists realize that this, they, there's no recession and that the S and P is going to make two seventy five in earnings next year, right? Which means that the S and P is going to be somewhere at fifty six to fifty seven. 
right? And so the hardest part for this market is not so much about building that spreadsheet out, right? It's the psychological event of, of, of how does this and when does this get priced in? And you know, you and I, you guys, we've been talking about this before. In this ETF-driven market, everything gets priced in so much earlier. Everything. That's why people say, "Are you going to test the lows? Are you going to do this? Are you going to do that?" I don't know. What I know is that by the end, by by the time Labor Day comes along, we're going to be saying that was easy, right to infinity and beyond. And everybody's going to be kicking themselves that they should have bought Amazon at two thousand and twenty lows, right? In at you know this at this level, and guys, it's never easy, right? Emotionally, it is, and psychologically, it's very, very difficult for me to sit there and have such a non-consensus view. When the easy trade is to say the Fed's going to raise rates to five to six percent, and we're going into a recession, right? That's the easy trade. It's wrong, and that wouldn't do justice to our clients, would it? Nope. Um, I think we have time for one more question. What do you got there, Tyler? You, you want one of mine or you got right. one going? You can go ahead. Well, this is uh, probably not the one to wrap up on, but I'm just interested in your sense of, uh, I guess you would call it surprise job numbers for Canada in the month of December. You know, we we had uh, jobs that were primarily government for the last year and a half. And these numbers basically say this is all non-government full-time jobs. What do you make of that? Um, so if you haven't learned or get notice, I like these old rules, right? Right. So, so first off, hours worked declined, right? So I'm going to cut hours before I cut people, right? That's one. Wage growth. In Canada, hourly wage growth, negative, negative, right? So, you know, I, I just, I am very leery of looking at the headline numbers. And, you know, I'm going to, I'm on TV and I'm saying, you know, that this, this, the biggest mistake the Bank of Canada made and the Fed made, in my humble opinion, so let's let let's go let let's go back right. When Trump got in, there was a massive visceral response by central bankers that said we were part of the cause, because every time in the economy started to pick up, and every time there was wage growth, we hammered it down. We made the middle class workers in North America and the Western world like a pinata. And the way we fought inflation was through making sure wages in the labor market was weak. And that took the standard of living of the middle class worker in this country down and it gave the rise of populism, right? They went back to that playbook. They know that playbook is wrong. They know that wages didn't cause inflation. They know that jobs are a lagging, the most lagging indicator. So why am I bullish about this? Is because you know what? It's good that the private sector is 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 starting to put bring some people back in the private sector, not the public sector. Let's be clear, right? And that's my view of why we're going to get a soft landing, because you know structurally speaking, the labor market is tight, right? And I you know there's not a lot that I agree with with the federal government and the liberals. But one thing I do agree with is that they're increasing the immigration policy up to 500,000 a year because we need more people in the country, right? And you know, think about this, we're possibly going to double our population between in my lifetime, right? We're probably maybe, I mean, I hope I live to, to over eight. I hope, I'll put it this way, I don't know. I hope I live long enough to see the Leafs win the cup. Okay, <laughs> which means hang hundreds. on, buddy. Hang yeah. on. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but you know what I would say to you is I uh, one of the things that we're unique on is the labor market, right? And they know this. They know this, and they're going to pivot. So the reason why the 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 bank we're not going to go into recession is that the labor market's going to be okay and it's non-inflationary. 
how they get out of the Pandora's box that they did and use that as the real reason why this happened, I don't know. And I don't care. Right. But everybody knows it. And I would just say to you that that number, here's the other thing that's very interesting, right? Um, all these layoffs are happening in the United States. If you get a lay, if you're laid off, you get a package and you don't become unemployed until after the package gets done. So if we're laying people off right now, you know, you're not going to see unemployment spike up for three to six months. And then it, could, then it, then it happens, right? So it's going to happen. Um, the other thing I would say to you about the job numbers in the United States and about this is where I'll, I'll be a little bit, I don't want to get too esoteric with you guys, but let me, let me give you a, a story, right? So I don't look at seasonal adjustment numbers, right? Why? And, and, and you learn, right? I mean, I've gone through so many cycles. So everybody remember to, uh, 9-11, right? 9-11 happened. And basically the uh, global, the Western economy was shut for about two months. And they tried to seasonally adjust that effect away. And what happened was, is those seasonal adjustments gave a wrong picture of what the economy looked like. And then a year later, in the fall of 2020, sorry, to the fall of 2002, they readjusted the seasonal adjusted numbers. And they made the world look completely different. Okay. So what am I saying to you? If you look at the non-seasonally adjusted numbers in the labor market, it's not that strong. Okay. If you look at the non-seasonally adjusted numbers or what they call the household data in the United States, job growth isn't as strong as everybody thinks. The job numbers that we are seeing are fudged because of the seasonal adjustments that Stack Can and the Labor Bureau statistics did. Uh, the, the Federal Reserve of Philadelphia did a study that said the bed that the bank that over a period of time, the first two quarters of last year, only ten thousand jobs were created in the United States, not the millions that were suggested by the establishment survey. That report had to be given and presented to the FOMC at the Fed. It was, and it actually we've entered into the minutes of the Fed. No one talked about it. So what am I saying to you guys? I would not be surprised if sometime in the next couple of months, next year, they come back and they say, you know what? Those seasonally adjusted numbers were wrong. And think about this. We had two negative quarters of GDP last year in the United States, which is a traditional measure of a recession. But what did we hear from the pundits oh, and the government? This is the thing that I just I blows my mind, right? Is the government said, no, it's not a recession because of the labor market. Well, what if the labor market numbers are all wrong? And this is what happened in 2002. The government comes after the fact and goes, guys, guess what? You know what? We had a recession in 2001, right? So I would not be surprised if somewhere in 2023 or 2024, the government comes back and says, oh, my bad. You know what? You know, in 2022, we did have that recession. <laughs> And uh, so, 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 I'm 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 open-minded. I look at non-seasonally adjusted data. I hope that the Fed and the Bank of Canada pivot so that they don't bomb Main Street. It's not their fault. I'm happy that job growth is happening in the private sector, and I hope that the central bankers go back and anchor off of the research they did before COVID that said it was wrong to, to, to blame the working folk of the country for inflation. The data doesn't bear it out. Very good. Very good. That's awesome, Jim. Um, I think we've reached, reached the end of our time for the day today with you. I uh, want to thank you for taking time out of your day to, to spend it with us and listen to our questions and 
and we'll have to see if your crystal ball is as clear as it needs to be and see where 2023 plays out. Sounds great, guys. You guys be safe, okay? Thanks, you as man. well. Take care, guys. Thank right. you.